So while folks are getting logged on, um, I'm looking for uh, two scribes to take notes. Uh, today we have a presentation, so the uh, notes for today um, will be particularly useful for uh, making sure that, that everyone um, in SIG security has the, the context of uh, what's going on. And as someone who is a cloud person that works at Vintech, I'm very interested. <laughs> it doesn't. All right, still don't have any new scribes. Hey, Dan, Mark here. I'll try to do it today. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. All right, I need one more individual to uh, help mark out, and then uh, I think we can get started. Let's, uh, have you run through this presentation? Do you have uh, a sense of, uh, you know, how much of the hour we have together um, I should be allocating? I plan on prioritizing. I've not run through them um, in, in a continuous manner. It's, but it, um, it's fairly short. It's just 11 slides. So I don't know, 20 minutes with, with discussion should be fine, if that's OK. <laughs> I, should I, I, I can you, do you it. Obviously never Quicker. discuss with this crew. <laughs> we, we, we will have a discussion. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so. 10 minutes of presentation. Uh, I'm going to pad your estimate on uh, discussion, given you know, especially the the, the interest. Uh, you know, there, there are uh, a number of us uh, uh, on the um, members here that are actually uh, in FinServe uh, and uh, you know, really interested in, in that. So you know, we're we're, we're also uh, going to be very interested in sort of that context sharing for non-SIG related interests. Perfect. All right, do we have someone uh, supporting Mark as a scribe? I need one more scribe today and then uh, Michael Ducey is uh, driving, so it cannot be Michael. <laughs> oh, I can scribe. Thank you, Justin, appreciate it. All right, let's go ahead and get started because I do think that, like I said, it was just saying, I think we're going to get into some interesting discussions and then we have uh, some ongoing efforts that uh, I'd like to get check ins to. But, you know, since we've been, um, you know, a bit sort of keeping the trains running uh, and, you know, working on our work. Um, Focused in you know last three months, and you know we're we're beginning just to to restart some of our presentations. I want to you know make sure we we, we um, get that in get that, uh, the time it deserves. All right, uh, so uh, we had our second follow up uh, with our um, TOC liaisons. Uh, uh, scheduled for today. Uh, unfortunately, Joe Beta um, is out this week, and uh, we will be reconvening there um, in in one week. So uh, next week we'll have uh, a little bit more news in uh, the ongoing coordination and alignment with our TOC liaisons. Uh, you know, their uh, top priority right now is sort of normalizing the. Um, the ingest process and sort of uh, how those things are uh, are flowing through the TOC. Um, we're looking for um, alignment and further insight on the um, security assessment and um, security assessment prioritization uh, process. Uh, and but you know we've had ex expectations managed uh, to us that um, the that process is likely to be a um, 
influenced by the, the outcomes of the rest of the episode. So that's something that I'm, I'm tracking closely. Um, Emily. Hello, this is Emily Fox, National Security Agency. Um, we met, uh, or we talked yesterday about the SIG Security Day. Um, I've updated the tickets with uh, the notes from that meeting, as well as um, linked in the Trello board. So if anybody's interested in understanding where we're at and what things are going on, you could check out issue, I believe it's 209. Um, the Right now, I'm waiting to hear back from Amy and Emily Ruff concerning website content for that event. And that's about it. Excellent. Christian? Uh, so um, I'm here on behalf of RxM. We are uh, just trying to make sure that we're in, uh, we're in the loop when it comes to the developments with uh, the SIG Securities work. Uh, we actually did read your, uh, well, the white paper that was dis uh, that you guys published uh, was distributed internally, so we're going through and re reading and reviewing that. So I'm sitting in. Awesome. Uh, Christian, is that specifically the, the policy white paper that's uh, in progress? Uh, yes. Yes. Awesome. Is. Thank you. Thank you. Abhinav? Hi, guys. This is Abhinav. Uh, this is my first meeting. So, uh, yeah, I'm a VP and head of information security at Frame uh, IO, a New York City startup. Uh, we are just moving to Kubernetes, and, but we, are, we have been using Falco for quite some time. And I met Michael Dushi last week and he was in New York. He, he told me about this meeting, so I, that's why I joined. Excellent. Welcome. Thank Mark. you. Hey, Mark here. Nothing new to report. Um, I wanted to mention briefly that uh, the NIST Big Data Working Group, which is wrapping up their work, it's still in review, like it's month three of reviews for, at NIST before the official final report comes out. The leader there is interested in working on a framework that the University of Indiana, and I'll put this in the notes for the other note taker, don't try to catch this, uh, to uh, build a reusable set of APIs, which they're calling the big data cloud mesh kind of thing, uh, which is interest, which there's interest in the sponsor in having a set of use cases around analytics that would uh, exploit this set of APIs. Um, you know, I'd like to hook them up with other people with that interest. So if anybody on this group is interested, I'll put them in touch with the professor at the University of Indiana who's who's working on this. There's a, a GitHub project around this with some of the artifacts in there that you can poke around and look at, but um, it's it's pretty much TBD to see where it's gonna go from here. That's it for me. Thank you, Mark. Is, uh, is the University of Indiana and Indiana University the same thing? Yes, they are, sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are some, some previous uh, Linux Foundation uh, efforts that have been tied to that. Um, and let me see if I can, uh, you know, pull that up. Um, and because that, that might connect some of the resources that are, you know, working on this to that and facilitate cool. driving that forward. You're right. IU is the normal way of referring to it. Okay. Got it. Uh, Michael. Michael reaches for mute. You're still muted, Michael, if you're talking to me. Did we lose Michael Ducey? I'll I'll come come see yeah, I don't I don't see him on the list anymore either. Uh so come back around to, to Michael Ducey. Uh if uh he shows up, uh you know, call it out in chat. Um Justin. Cormac. Um, yeah, so I've, I've, uh, I've been mainly reading the Kubernetes security review, which is long and interesting, um, and trying to work out which bits of it are actually being 
implemented and and so on. Because some of the, I, I was actually expecting the recommendations to be kind of, I mean, I was kind of expecting the recommendations to be to have CVEs and to be actioned, mm -hmm. but actually they they have internal code numbers and some of them have been actioned and some of them haven't. And it's kind mm -hmm. of um, um, uh, but some of them are quite long-term things to fix and some of them are quite short-term things. So it's, a, it's a quite a mix. Um, and I haven't finished re reading all the supporting docs yet either. So it's, but um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff there. Is, is it worth uh, sharing out uh, in, in, you know, carving out 10, 20 minutes uh, in a meeting to, um, to share that? context that you're, well, we, you're have, we, had a, we kind of had a, a small overview from the authors last week I think okay okay um, uh, which was helpful but I think yeah that was just was it last other week just but that was just before it had been released so mm -hmm. there's a lot of it to digest so it may definitely make sense to um, yeah, and, and this would be much more our synthesis of you know, SIG security, more uh, uh, synthesis of this rather than you know what others think. Um, so I'd like to. to yeah, know, no, I think it. Personally. I think it definitely makes sense. I think there's a there's a lot of um, yeah, there's a lot of quite interesting things in it, and there's a, there's some discussion that some of us have been having about Kubernetes threat models and things that I th because there's a whole threat model document now and things that I think would right. be interesting to discuss. Yeah. Um, um, but, uh, yeah definitely give people a bit of time to, to read it all because there's a lot of it. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a note that we're going to, you know, slot in that agenda item um, at some point in the future and, you know, we'll just check back in when, when the right time, uh, you know, especially if we can get uh, you know, a couple different perspectives uh, that have gone through and digested it all. Uh, that that would be really nice. Craig, hi, uh, Craig Ingram from the Security Audit Working Group. Um, so yeah, definitely appreciate that the feedback, Justin, and uh, I've been enjoying watching the community response to a lot of the the reports as it's come out and uh, a lot of action being taken on issues that have been opened already too, and things being closed out pretty quickly. So uh, it's been cool to see folks kind of rally around that and, and, uh, fix some bugs. Um, as far as like the, the CVEs and stuff, yeah, totally, uh, get that. And that definitely makes sense. Um, we, that was kind of left up to the PSC as far as like making that decision. Um, uh, so the product security council committee, whatever the, <laughs> their, their current acronym is. Um, uh, so, you know, they had obviously a preview beforehand of, of the report and the findings just to make sure, hey, do we need to embargo anything? And it ended up being, you know, no, we can work on these out in the open. So um, if there are missing CVEs or things that seem CVE worthy, then then I think that's totally up for uh, making a request to, to MITRE and getting getting that designated for sure. Well, uh, the, the one I particularly noticed today was that which I should, there's a, I think Fix just got merged today was for um, high SCSI passwords mm -hmm. in logs, which is the sort of thing you'd expect a CVE for because it's a straightforward, um, you know, credential leak that people that people may need to be aware of to take action on. Some of the, some sure. of them, are less, but that one was a very seemed a very clear cut case for a CVE. Yep. Yeah, and I think there's another similar one about you know things things showing up in logs that that shouldn't um, that would probably fall in the same category. Sorry for the notes. This is related to the trail project, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. The, yeah. Got it. Excellent. Uh, let's. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Lutz Binka. I work for Figo, um, as it's still called. Name, name will change. And everything else I do, uh, you'll see in a couple of minutes. Wayne? Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm, I'm from Alibaba, so I want to in introduce myself, uh, my, myself first. Um, we use Kubernetes a lot in our company, and we care a lot about the security. So uh, this is the first meeting I'm, I'm joined 
I'm joining, so I'm I'm trying to follow, uh, following up your steps, and uh, I'll appreciate if you can give me some guide how to start my journey on the Kubernetes security. Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, you know, at a, at a high level, I recommend, you know, kind of watching the work stream, uh, you know, maybe for a couple meetings. And then uh -huh. uh, we have a few major work streams around uh, security assessments, uh, policy, and some other initiatives um, that uh, uh, we are always looking for support on. Uh, so, uh, you know, mm, listen for the, you know, call outs for, for needs and participation. And, uh, um, you know, I, I would, uh, um, you know, reach out and, and uh, you know, volunteer once, once you feel uh, comfortable that, that uh, uh, there's an opportunity that aligns with your interests. Mm -hmm. I, I look, I, um, I think I have read some files that uh, uh, I look through the GitHub issues. Uh, there is a label uh, named uh, "Have Wanted," but I think the list is uh, almost empty. So, <laughs> yeah, yes. I, I would like to help, but uh, nice, nice. Yeah, you know, we'll we'll do some some triage there. Uh, we we uh, you know after we got ratified and went through um, you know uh, KubeCon Europe. Uh, we've doubled our uh, regular attendance and, uh, um, you know, uh, have gotten a lot more help. So great. Okay. Uh, the fact that our, our help wanted queue is uh, getting burnt down is, uh, is good news. <laughs> okay, okay. Great. Well, uh, nice to have you on board. Yeah, nice to meet you all. Thank you. Julia? Hello. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is my first meeting as well. I'm working on uh, implementation of security for network service mesh. And I'm just curious what happens here. So just want to listen. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who I've missed? Uh, that would like to check in if uh, if you're new uh, and or uh, don't want to check in that's uh, perfectly fine uh, i do invite you to uh, to sign in to our minutes uh, which i've just dropped into the chat hello there hello there hi young yeah yeah, yeah. Did, did you? I, i'm new to this group and i'm working for entrepreneurial and uh, uh, yeah, yeah entrepreneurial we just want to improve the security of our uh, infra infrastructure and uh, it, it, that's including uh, Kubernetes, uh, it, it still and other uh, cloud native uh, components. So I'm um, just joining this group and just uh, want to know what is uh, the uh, next step of the cloud native security and uh, want to uh, keep each other up, up to date. Great, welcome. Did Michael Ducey reconnect? Robert, great to see you. I'm going to transition from uh, from check-ins to uh, kicking off our, our presentation. Let's uh, for the sake of time. Um, so, welcome uh, anyone who's just joining. Please do sign in. Uh, that way, we can uh, you know record your uh, your attendance. Um, so today we have a presentation uh, on uh, fintech Kubernetes, and uh, let's you, you're um, welcome to take over. Do you are you familiar with the presenting via Zoom? Um, I guess we'll find out. Um, <laughs> first, uh, so the slides you, uh, or the document for the slides is in the chat, and now I will we'll try to find the right uh, window to share. Uh, please give me a couple of seconds. You bet. Come on. You should, yeah, you should see just a single slide. Yeah, okay. Um, hi. <clears throat> um, 
I would like to, ah, sorry. I would like to uh, give you a quick insight into uh, who we are, what we do with Kubernetes, and then some ideas of how we see the world as far as security is concerned, um, what we implement, and um, the major part on the last couple of slides will be something that we run into, some hurdles, some obstacles, and basically a wish list, list that uh, in a perfect world, uh, Kubernetes and the cloud and native um, landscape would provide for us um, in order to get, out, get more security, whatever that uh, specifically means. Uh, we are a German fintech. Um, we've been, we are actually in the um, process of moving the last uh, uh, customers to our Kubernetes-based platform, um, and we provide a API for banking as a service. That automatically means we are a heavily regulated, heavily regulated industry. So there's another things we can't do. We cannot use pl public cloud providers. It, it possibly now, but it's very difficult because it's always a question of who gets to audit whom. Um, uh, auditors in general are our biggest bane because they ask the same questions over and over again, slightly differently each time. And we have to, to find out what they actually are asking, not what the text of the question actually means. Um, we are, um, we have customers that are banks themselves, as well as um, other fintechs and, and um, mid-sized companies that simply uh, use our uh, license as a service. Um, because we are licensed, we can have them do financial transactions uh, across our platform. Um, we also serve uh, some APIs to uh, mainly mobile um, tools and thus interact with account holders and users directly. We are uh, in Hamburg and Berlin, Berlin and um, we are currently merging, and that's what I said. the The name will probably change, so don't be surprised if I give you a different name of whom I work for in the next uh, next couple of weeks. Um, as far as uh, Kubernetes uh, is concerned, we are pretty small compared to others. Um, we just have uh, fifty mid-sized nodes. Um, the most specific thing is we do everything on bare metal, running CoreOS. And we have built a automatic deployment mechanism that uh, takes um, all the applications directly from a Git repository and, and from um, configuration from a Git repository and uh, actual, actual applications uh, via Helm. Uh, currently, we do soft multi-tenancy because we uh, deploy the same application in multiple namespaces to isolate. But um, we are gearing up for hard multi-tenancy where um, partners and customers would actually get access to some form of uh, Kubernetes API. Um, how much and how filtered and, and how this is done is still a subject of research and discussion, but uh, the requirement is visible on the horizon and we are gearing up for that. Um, as far as security goals and design principles is concerned, uh, we do zero trust, um, even though we think that nobody should be in our uh, cluster, um, we still don't assume so th that. Um, and we have a fairly straightforward um, sense of uh, requirements because the thing that we most uh, have to protect is the um, user credentials of the online uh, customers then the other things are the usual stuff, it should work. What we're trying to achieve, and this is um, mainly, mainly one of the things that I'll get into in my um, obstacles list, is to never have a human actually working within our production cluster. There, isn't, there shouldn't be an admin. Um, everything should be um, via uh, Git controls, via, via um, Git ops. And that has been surprisingly hard to do, um, mainly because we don't write everything ourselves where it would be simple to do so, but we use a, a lot of um, third party um, components and I'll get into that in a bit more uh, detail. 
Um, and we also try to do defense of the in depth, um, defense in depth. Um, and um, so far we have been, we uh, think we have been successful in that because there were CVEs uh, that everybody got, got really in, uh, up in arms about where we thought that it would not be as uh, problematic for us. Okay, the, the next is just the, the usual stuff. We do MTLS, of course, because we do zero, to, or we uh, aim for zero trust. Um, we basically have everything uh, encrypted addressed. And um, what our secret sauce to a certain extent is, is that we don't create um, secrets by hand. They are all automatically by this deployment mechanism created from a, a HashiCorp vault. Uh, and uh, put into uh, Kubernetes secrets. And we are um, in the process of getting ready to do better workload attestation so that we can eliminate a, no a lot of these secrets, which are only uh, there for uh, one component identifying or authenticating to another. As I said, we do bare metal. And um, then we we do everything that uh, um, Kubernetes provides to a certain extent, more or less. We um, you see the the usual acronyms there. In addition to that, we deploy um, a IDS from Neuvector, which uh, basically gives us an insight and, and a fairly nice UI to see whom is trying to talking to whom, and um, we can intercept that if we want to. Um, but it's at the, at the moment, we use it more as a um, detection than as a um, policy enforcement tool. Okay, now the, the other part of our secret sauce is Deploy-D. It's a solution written in-house that uh, takes um, a configuration and uh, deploys it based on a trigger uh, that is set or that is um, called by our CI pipeline and it only will take a um, fixed a whitelisted uh, list of branches uh, if one of those is triggered by the event um, then the, it pulls the helm charts and renders them out to the cluster we do not use tiller um, and it will also automatically populate all the secrets from the HashiCorp vault. As I said, the goal here is to have no human intervention in the cluster. Uh, this is in, very helpful in ha having a development environment that looks very much like the production environment where you, the devs can have all the secrets they want. Um, or they can set them themselves. They can uh, put them in the development vault um, fairly easy to work with, but they will automatically be replaced with actual uh, production values by Deploy-D. And therefore, there is nothing uh, that can be accidentally put into the source repo. There is nothing that a dev can leak. Um, and we hope at one point to read a po reach a point where even an admin that we still have to have for certain corner cases um, is not able to leak anything because they can't know. But now the next, from, from here on in, this is basically a laundry list of uh, things that don't really work, that are hard to do. And I'm very aware of the fact that I'm probably barking up the wrong tree and I'm maybe even preaching to the choir here. Um, and that this is in no way to um, re detract from the good work and, and, uh, and very helpful work that has been done on security in Kubernetes. But some of these things are really hard to do for a small organization. Um, we have to be very, very aware about um, developer productivity. Um, for instance, using Spiffy um, makes it hard to you to do to work offline um, it may not be impossible but it makes it harder and also we are working with banks and most of the banks are very conservative um, 
and the most conservative of the um, uh, representatives of these banks are their auditors because um, they see the world in a certain way and if you come with new ideas then they often understand things as you can see from these uh, quotes that, that they're actual uh, quotes that happened in, in discussions with auditors um, they uh, see the world in a certain way and if it if what you're doing does not fit this world the answer is no and there's it's hard to work around that the biggest obstacle uh, to more security for us is uh, actually managing the supply chain uh, uh, the software supply chain security because we have an incredible uh, complexity of direct and more um, indirect dependencies uh, as we are not Google or other large organizations that can write or, e or at least review everything, uh, every single line of code that we put into our system. Um, we don't, for that reason, we don't use signed images. I would love to do that, but what's the point? It, it would be just, um, signing something that I cannot control completely because uh, of the complexity of uh, dependencies or the, the, the sheer number of de um, dependencies. And this is even a problem with, uh, with the IDS. We'll have we'll had a number of cases where an image, a base image was reported as uh, containing a um, code that has a CVE and after um, a lot of manual investigation, we found out that yes, um, Coro or not Coros, um, CentOS uh, version XYZ has um, CVE that's ag active against that, but only in a component or in a, in a package that is not installed by default and uh, definitely not in the stripped down version that was the base image for some tool that we're using. Um, so, any tooling that or any concerted effort or, or standard procedure that would allow us to, to easier identify who wrote what and what's the quality and, and the, uh, the input to all these components, all these dependencies would go a long way toward improving uh, ch supply chain security. The next thing is, as I said, we are trying to eliminate the admin. Um, but sometimes that's fairly hard because components assume that there is an admin. They will uh, even ask for money for their fantastic UI, um, which is nice to look at. And it often gives good insights into what's going on, but also th they uh, require you to configure the system once it's running um, down to even closing ports or um, uh, setting security controls. Now, the, the network side isn't that bad in uh, if you run it in Kubernetes as it would be by running it uh, straight into the in the internet or available to the internet. But there are a number of things, for instance, that in Elasticsearch are very hard to do um, in an upfront manner or in a declarative, declarative uh, configuration way. Um, some components have that as a uh, stated design goal. Ambassador is one example, and uh, not the only one, but uh, one that uh, that's dear to me because we're using that uh, quite a lot. And um, it would be, I think it would be very helpful to um, identify um, CNCF landscape com product or projects that have this, this design goal or this feature that they are completely configurable um, in a declarative manner. Um, even turning off or, or dumbing down the UI would be very helpful. Um, and I think the, this group could um, work to state um, such design goals that are conductive to security. Um, hopefully some projects will adopt them. Um, It's then the next thing is how do components I, um, authenticate to each other? Um, it is for me, and it is hard to, to define or, or um, show what the, 
the benefits of something like Spiffy compared to uh, Kubernetes um, onboard secrets are, um, especially in in um, in an environment where I have to f find a good reason to um, uh, for the effort that it would take to an, uh, implement um, workload attestation. Um, I seem to have been somewhat uh, successful because we're uh, we have that on the agenda now. The next really big pain point with uh, all the MTLS is the certificate management. Um, every single component has its own, or every single project has its own way of doing cert management. Um, it is not easy to find out what certificates are currently deployed um, and actually it running in, in um, or being used. Um, and Kubernetes itself isn't any better. Um, the root, cert, uh, root certificate rotation is painful. Uh, there is um, no easy way to, to, to find out what uh, the exact certificate is. And for instance, uh, which certificates within the, the whole um, uh, cluster should be rotated ne next or should be replaced next because there's no auto rotation. Um, all of that gets even harder if um, uh, certificate management is one of the regulated areas because we have to do it in a certain way and um, not doing that is not an option. Um, the next thing I should have, what? A, Um, the, the, overall, the security management is difficult to um, to maintain in an in an ongoing manner. Um, I have not yet found a tool or a process to generate the um, the documents or that um, the auditors would uh, re require. So um, having some standardized way of generating standardized documents would go a long way, um, even if uh, semi-manually, but uh, ideally automatically. Um, because we are a small company, um, this takes up a lot of manpower uh, for, for jobs that are basically not fun, so it probably would help. Um, there's been some efforts with the security, um, um, CNCF Financial Users Group. Um, and we, we are an active in that as well. Um, not me personally, but a colleague of mine. Um, so we, we hope to see some, um, some movement there. Okay, from now, there, from now on there's my personal, um, wouldn't it be nice wish list. Um, some of this may not even be possible to solve, but um, as a, as a user uh, presentation, I thought I'd give you some um, of my pain points. Um, at the declarative configuration we covered. Actually, that's uh, we covered that in total. So I'm sorry for that. But MTLS is not the standard, or, or does not seem to be the standard, and and. Um, uh, the normal way to do things um, with a number of components. Yes, they can be uh, turned on, but um, it, it's some obscure, often badly um, documented uh, configuration and um, the, so the, the, the projects don't have a feeling for the complex certificate and key management issues and, and uh, it, details that uh, quickly arise if you use uh, MTLS everywhere. Um, the next is to have more security by default. That is, that might make it, make in, may increase the learning curve to start with Kubernetes. Um, but the simple things as the non-secured API uh, interface, that's the default. Why? I know that some of these points have been covered in the 
in the white paper and the, the security analysis, um, I can only agree fully hearted, full heartedly. And more steps towards the fantasy land is please let's have unmovable key support everywhere um, where I can keep my uh, keys in an HSM or uh, maybe even HashiCorp Vault, that would be a start. And um, a general understanding that keys cannot be cop copied where you need them, but they have to be uh, requested or their use has to be re requested from somewhere else. Some components start with that, but it's, it's really hard. Um, and my, my last wish, and, and this is definitely something in, in, in uh, fantasy land with unicorns and everything, would be a, a measurement of how many layers of defense are left. Um, somehow, even if I have to, if this is just a, a form of, of documentation or, or, or modeling or um, anything like that, um, in, in, um, together with a, with a threat uh, model um, that tells me, well, if this uh, barrier has been compromised by CVEX, then you have still um, N more layers um, that protect your vital data, which are the customer credentials in our case. Um, so we, at least we have the advantage of being able to identify what we want to protect. Um, and if there is any research on, on doing such a defensive, uh, defensive depth -o meter, um, I'd be very interested in that. And with that, I'm done. Thank you very much. Let's thank you. That was great. Uh, I'm sure I have uh, tons of questions. I'm sure others uh, do too. Um, so, Let's see. Um, you left such delicious candy there at the end. Uh, I want to try to avoid uh, rabbit holing on you know uh, the fantasy land. Uh, <laughs> um, let me scroll back to the, the previous slide where you tee up the um, interesting you know challenge of. Um, basically doing the, the organizational handshake uh, uh, between a vendor and a large organization. Um, do you have any uh, you know, uh, potential strategies around exploring that? Um, as a former vendor who uh, uh, you know, now works at uh, PayPal, you know, large uh, financial services company that tends to be a bit more progressive, uh, and you know works uh, closely with with vendors. Um, I've seen um, that that particular challenge from both sides of the aisle, um, and honestly, it's painful um, on both sides. Uh, and you know, if uh, if there was a a mechanism or you know coalition to um, move that forward, the on the vent um, and the um, end user. Um, the customer side of things, uh, you know, there would definitely be interest in in aligning with that. Okay, um, it's it's an, an interesting for me that uh, to understand that the the pain or, or no, it's actually not that surprising. But um, I I have to um, continuously make myself um, remember that that it's a pain point on both sides. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think, and this has been, um, the, 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 I think common theme with, um, uh, commercial, uh, um, financial services user group as well is to have, a a common, a common framework. Um, if, if only of documents or, or, um, or audit questions, um, procedures, things like that. Um, that everybody can agree to. If you say we do it like that, or we do it like that, but uh, differently uh, in in point A, B, C, um, it would go uh, a, a long step forward to reducing the the, um, the manual work of understanding and generating uh, documents that 
will only be weighed but never read. Um, so that that would probably be uh, be helpful. Um, it's the the question then is who who accepts that as a as a base? Um, for instance, in Germany we have had. Um, a, um, a federal agency generating documents like these for a long time. Of course, mm -hmm. there are requirement or required to use for uh, federal agencies. Um, okay. But other than that, it's a lot of that is um, yes, the, the normal things um, lock the door uh, kind of stuff. Um, but it's a lot of paper, and it's. Uh, I'm not sure if, if another framework like these will help, um, but we need something. So it's, I don't have the, the, the magic bullet there either, no. But, right. but having this, this agreed upon uh, framework probably would help a lot. Right. Even just by, by, by weight of, of community. Right. Hi, this is Abhinav. So uh, one question. Did you face any challenges when you deploy pod security policies or network security policies? So for example, network security policies, you need to know how your services are communicating, right? I mean, if you deploy blanket policies, they can disrupt the services, or if you uh, deploy overly broad policies that don't serve the purpose that they intend to serve. So how did, did you guys face any challenges uh, around that? And if yes, how did you solve that? Um, for understanding who talks to whom, um, the Neuvector um, IDS was very helpful because you can run it in a learning mode where it'll just list who talks to whom. And we have this development environment that re uh, reflects the, the actual production environment to an, a sufficient degree. Other than that, especially network uh, policies and, and um, pod, uh, security policies, it's just um, grunt work. Um, you, we we are we are moving to um, to a point where we say uh, you can't communicate. If you want to change that, come to me, but and and state exactly what you have. And if uh, other than that, you can't. It's it's forbidden. Everything's forbidden. Um, and it, it's a discussion. It's an ongoing discussion. And I think there's no real. There's no secure way around having this ongoing discussion. Um, it's easier than um, old school firewall rules because there is not this, um, or there's not this context switch from components talking to each other to network numbers and port numbers, but rather I can, uh, uh, describe it in a in a declarative, declarative manner of of the lang or of the names of the components that are talking to each other. Um, so maybe we just got lucky with the way we discussed uh, def or um, designed our namespaces. So it, it's it's just grunt work. Got it. Thanks. So uh, it's Mark Underwood here. So. So I also work in financial services. So we got several of us here that are mired in that space. I'm wondering if the uh, Germany federal regulators accept any of your automated artifacts at all. Um, I'm not sure is the, the, the honest, uh, complete answer. Um, but in the end, it's, it's often uh, generating documentation that makes them uh, assume that you are doing it thoroughly more than anything else, uh, that you have basically have a plan and follow that. Um, there's also the um, BSI specifications that generally follow this idea that yes, there are certain simple controls, as I said, like lock the door and, and uh, have a metal cage around your, your computers. But other than that, it's um, having a plan. And uh, having a plan and, and automatically uh, documenting that you're following it um, actually does help, help a lot. Uh, last year, they wanted us to do some screenshots of some tool that control, controls some network component um, in order to, to document that we were following or we were doing something along the lines of the plan. Um, 
that's for us that's a, a lot or too much uh, manual work to take screenshots um, but if they accept screenshots then the the assumption is they'll um, uh, accept automated re uh, reports uh, any day so just a, a placeholder for a future discussion the OCC who's the main regulator in the US convened a meeting with our DevOps standard in IEEE in which they tried to talk about reverse engineering DevOps from the regulator's point of view, i.e. deconstruct the artifacts that were coming out of DevOps so that they could consume them in a DevOps methodology as a regulator. Seems to me that's kind of where we need to get with the whole reg tech space in order to make this happen because it's, it's not just the problem with this, with the tool of Kubernetes or you know, the, the things that are coming out of the open source community, it's, it's broader than that and they need to be part of the solution in some specific ways. I couldn't agree more. Uh, do you have any um, docs or, or standards that you can point me to? I've, well, I've I can, seen the... Sure, I, it was an abandoned conversation. We had five or six meetings with them. You know, they seemed very interested and then they concluded it with no artifacts, so I don't know if that means they have a plan they're going to announce to us or if somebody inside the OCC killed the project, I just don't know. Oh. But that would be under the um, DevOps IEEE umbrella, right? Right. It's the 2675 working group. I see. I'll put mm -hmm. it in the chat. Any other uh, topics that we have? Uh, just a few more minutes. Any other topics that uh, folks would like to jump into? Well, I just put on the agenda to just highlight the recent CVE cluster for Envoy, which coincidentally was on our list of Thank you. things we wanted to maybe reassess. Mm -hmm. And I think the, un the underlying point I wanted to make was this notion that you know a security audit is you know point in time artifact and that you know this notion that you can just say something has a security yeah. audit you know that's right. not suitable <laughs> clearly the the on the envoy security issues are the same ones as the go ones and therefore apply to everything building go as well is it because they were the general http2 vulnerabilities so they apply to okay. all http implementations wow. so go so also applies to Kubernetes and anything else that's using, potentially using HTTP two. So, oh, got it. And Nginx has Nginx has the same vulnerability as well. Mm -hmm. So, most people who are talking HTTP are vulnerable. Right. Right. Nobody does that. <laughs> wow, that's that's uh, that's quite the. Uh the impact. Justin, is that something you expect to see, uh, and, and Robert, excuse me, uh, is that something you expect to see more things pop up? Uh, like this is just the beginning and, you know. I don't know, I think it, it looks to me like no one had looked really hard at the kind of resource allocation issues with HTTP2, that we went through the whole thing with HTTP decades ago with slow loris was one and there was a bunch of them around then about the same kind of attacks and the http2 spec didn't wasn't very specific about how to deal with resource allocation issues and uh so but netflix spent a bit of time on it recently and i, I hopefully they found most most of the issues i mean i think they're relatively um understandable there were quite a few of them um uh but they and they did a coordinated disclosure with all the major implementations that so hopefully this is most of them but um yeah if people that i mean resource allocation issues are kind of rife through everything it's just easy to make things leak resources in general because it's not a threat model people think about much. Right. 
and HTTP2 is a fundamental re-envisioning of, you know, resource, uh, you know, the, the HTTP. Well, it's got more types of resource because it's got multiple channels. So you can leak channels or you can um, send things down multiple channels in small amounts and all the other kinds of types of thing because it's not just a single channel anymore. It's, um, and it's got a few other pieces around, um, header compression and things like that, that are also resource allocation issues. And, and the, the, the groups using uh, HTTP2 tend to be very T-shaped, where like the one thing that you actually, you know, find that you're, you really need HTTP2, you go really deep into it. And, you know, uh, HTTP2 as a spec is much broader in, uh, in the capabilities it's introducing to uh, the protocol. Uh, so, you know, one use case uh, may differ uh, in what it's tapping into. From well, also, I think a lot of people have just opt into, opted into it without really realizing because mm -hmm. software is totally. just updated to support sure. it. And it Next version. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep, and just word. Interesting. Great. Well, uh, Robert, thanks for highlighting that. Uh, do you think that that we need to um, carve out more time to to dive in uh, more deeply, or does that sort of uh, awareness uh, balloon there uh, cover the, the topic sufficiently? Um, I just okay. sent some feedback on the lifecycle PR that I put up there, and okay. uh, noting that it's still a work in progress. But I thought I'd throw up what I had. Um, just you know, to keep the momentum going and, and in line with CDs. But I think again, my my meta point is that I think the security assessment shouldn't be thought of as a single point in time. It's just it's a commitment. If, if people are serious about getting a security assessment, it should be a commitment to ongoing resource and, and allocation of time and, and review. Um, and I mean, not just that that might be onerous, especially for a critical component like an envoy. But um, yeah. I think those are table six. Right. Yep. It's a trade off we have in, you know, the collective reliance on um, open source components. Absolutely. So uh, I did drop, uh, you know, Robert's agenda item into, um, into the, the chat. Uh, and it is specifically uh, issue 152, right, Robert, that you're looking for yeah, that's it. And that should be linked to the pull request as well. And the PR is 125. Great. All right. Thanks for the heads up. Uh, that brings us to the end of today's meeting. Uh, if you have anything uh, specifically that you'd like to um, tee up for the, the next um, August 21st meeting, uh, please add them to the top of uh, our meeting notes. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for taking Bye, everyone. Have a good day.